And this week, I'm super excited to have Dr. Claudia Nishiewicz from Utah State University Extension join us. She is one of our extension plant pathologists. She works a lot with commercial growers all across the state of Utah, and she's one of our head researchers in the Utah Plant Diagnostic Lab. So I invited her on this evening to talk about some common tomato diseases that you guys might be finding in your gardens or your farms. So I'm gonna stop, stop sharing my screen and then kind of give it over to Claudia. Okay, let me see if I can get that to work. Can you see my screen now? I got it. so remember, like. Okay, let me try. I might have to start. Let's see. This. How about now? Can you see it now? It's almost like that commercial. Can you hear it now? <laughs> yeah, we see it. Okay, perfect. So I'll be talking about tomato diseases that we most commonly see in Utah. And here is sort of a list of the most common ones that I'll be covering today. And the last two, one is a, the tomato fruit pox is actually an abiotic problem and the russet mites are an insect problem. But since the symptoms look very similar to a disease, I'll include that as well. So the first disease I'm going to talk about is tomato spotted wilt virus. Tomato spotted wilt virus is an important pathogen of tomato, pepper, tobacco, and peanuts in the United States. Here in Utah, we frequently see it on tomatoes, and it's in the meantime sort of widespread across the state. Initially, it was mostly a problem if people bought their tomatoes at a grocery store or nursery that had imported plants from out of state. Is that me causing that background noise? No, nope, you're good. I'll mute people as they come in. Okay. And we also see it on peppers, but we've also seen it recently on cut flowers. So if you have dahlias or zinnias, they can get that virus too. So it's something to keep in mind when you're having your tomatoes in your garden. The virus is transmitted by thrips. Thrips are tiny insects, and you can see one up here that's highly magnified. On your plants, if you see an orange speck of dust that runs, that's a thrips. They have to acquire the virus as larvae, so they basically have to grow up on an infected plant, feed on that plant, then they acquire the virus during the feeding, and then once they have acquired the virus, the virus will multiply in the thrips and they can transmit it to other plants for their entire life. If an adult thrips that's not carrying the virus feeds on an infected plant, it might ingest the virus, but it will never be able to transmit the virus. Tomato spotted wilt virus is not seed borne. So if you buy seed, you don't have to worry about getting tomato spotted wilt virus in your plants. Plants can get infected early in the season. They may or may not show symptoms in, in early on. The usual symptoms you see on tomatoes are necrotic spots on leaves, and I'll show you pictures in a minute. You get wilting of plants. That's where the name comes from, the spots on the leaves and then the wilt. You get stunted plants necrotic rings on immature fruit, and chlorotic spots on mature fruit. So here are some pictures on the bottom right here. You see a picture of the leaf symptoms. And just looking at the leaves, it will not tell you 100% that this is tomato spotted wilt virus. There's other diseases, bacterial diseases, and can have very similar leaf symptoms. So we would have to do a test, either try to grow out the bacteria, or use some antibody-based test to test for the tomato spotted wilt virus. Up here, you see immature tomato fruit with brown necrotic ring spots, and then these are infected Roma tomatoes that have that calico pattern that um, the virus causes. I have not heard that it affects the flavor of the tomatoes, so you could should still be able to eat them. They're just looking. Weird. 
I did include some pictures of peppers for tomato spotty wilt virus. They, you get a calico pattern there too, and you also get ring spots on the leaves because most people grow peppers and tomatoes in their gardens. To manage tomato spotted wilt virus, good weed control can help. Tomato spotted wilt virus has over a thousand known hosts, and a lot of them are weeds. And weeds usually do not show symptoms of virus infections. They look perfectly fine. They learn to live with the virus. And you will never see symptoms, yet they are a reservoir. And if thrips grow up on these infected weeds and then feed on a tomato plant next to it, they can transmit the virus. In the last few years, there are resistant tomato varieties available that have been bred mostly for the southeastern United States, where the virus has been a problem for a long time. We tried growing them here in Utah. They do grow well. You will harvest fruit. And if you're a commercial grower, you would have to try these varieties and see if the fruit has the characteristics and qualities that your customers are looking for. There are no resistant pepper varieties. You can use reflective mulch. We are having a trial right now where we want to see if reflective mulch would deter the thrips from coming to the plants. And the reflective mulch is basically black plastic that's painted silver. And you can use insecticides for thrips control. You would have to make sure that you change the insecticides with different modes of actions periodically so you avoid resistance development. Now move on to curly top. Curly top is probably the most common virus disease known in Utah on tomatoes. In Utah, we Claudia, it. yes. Do you want me to can I ask a quick question from yes. someone right now or would you like me to wait? No, you can ask. Okay, so Lorraine from Facebook wants to know, since it's a virus, can it be carried in your compost if, you're comp if you compost those virus plants? Yes and no. If your compost gets hot enough, like 168 degrees or so, it probably will kill most viruses, but most compost piles do not get hot enough in every single spot. So I would never compost the disease plants regardless if it's a viral disease, a fungal disease bacterial disease. Okay, and I think that's good input for like any crop. If it's disease, yes. take it completely out of your site. That also applies to herbicides. Do not compost weeds that have been killed with herbicide because you will get a lot of herbicide damage in your plants potentially. Awesome, thank you. So in Utah, we mostly see it on tomatoes and peppers. There are other crops that can get it, beans, pumpkins, gourds, beets, spinach, hemp, zinnia, and amaranth. Causal agent is a group of viruses called curdoviruses. There's currently, I think, about seven known viruses. And they're transmitted by the beet leafhopper, which is that little guy down here. Now, beet leafhoppers do not like the taste of tomatoes. So they come, they see something green, they come to it, they bite into your tomatoes, they feed on them briefly, realize that's tomatoes, and they move on. So you never know that these beet leafhoppers were in your garden unless you put out like yellow sticky cards to catch them. But you will see about a week to 10 days later that the virus, that the beet leafhoppers were there because they left the virus behind and you see the symptoms in your tomatoes. So the symptoms you see Usually the leaf margins are turned upwards, even though the name curly top has nothing to do with that. It's actually named after the sugar beet symptoms where the virus was first found on. The leaves will turn yellow and oftentimes you see purple veins, which you can see here on the, the right hand side. Plants are often stunted if they're infected early in the season. You get premature fruit ripening. The fruit is not edible and you get stunted plants. To manage curly top, curly top's difficult to manage because the leaf, beet leaf hoppers don't stay long enough that you could get them with an insecticide. Floating row covers for young transplants have shown some promise as younger plants are more susceptible than older plants. 
shade cloth can help to repel the thrips or make the plants less visible to the thrips. Good weed control, there's a lot of weed hosts also present for curly top. And do not plant your tomatoes close to beets or spinach. I had a trial in Caseville last year and we are repeating it this year and the rows of tomatoes that were closest to the beets had the most curly top because the beets attract the leaf hoppers as does spinach and then that's a very short distance to the tomatoes so they will still feed on those tomatoes briefly. Tobacco or tomato mosaic virus that was the first virus that was ever identified over 100 years ago. It is seed borne in tomatoes and other plants and it's also seed transmitted transmitted by handling infected plants or tobacco. So if somebody chews tobacco, if somebody smokes tobacco and rolls their own cigarettes and handles the tobacco and then touches a tomato plant, they can spread tobacco mosaic virus. It can survive curing of tobacco. It survives for 50 years in plant debris. So it's very tough to kill and that one would probably not be killed in a compost pile. In contaminated pots, it survives. If you have trellises, it can survive on the string, on your knives and pruning tools. So you need to disinfect pots or tools. Better even use new pots and new twine trellises every year if you can. Um, disinfecting is difficult since this virus is very tough. Alcohol and a bleach solution can help. You need to change gloves when you handle plants. Ideally, you would use fresh gloves every time you handle a plant, but that might not be feasible for a commercial grower. The symptoms of tobacco mosaic virus can be very subtle. So here you see that mosaic pattern on the the tomatoes and it's very difficult to see that light green dark green pattern. You have to hold the leaves against the light in a in the right way that you can see these symptoms. That's why I think it's often missed in a field when tomatoes are harvested for seed. This is what the fruit looks like. Most of the time these are all hybrid tomatoes that are not resistant to the virus. Oftentimes, you, I've not seen symptoms on heirloom tomatoes on the fruit. I've seen it on the leaves. And for the hybrids, it was just the opposite. You saw the symptoms on the fruit, but not on the leaves. And as you can see, if you cut these rings open, the discoloration extends all the way into the flesh. To manage tobacco mosaic virus, use certified seed that's disease free. Use resistant varieties. There are quite a few resistant tomato varieties available, but they're all hybrids. Hmm. Heirlooms are not resistant. Disinfect your pots or tools. Replace the plant substrate in the greenhouse bed. So if you use the same beds, don't just cut the tomatoes, the vines off at, at the top and leave the roots in the soil, because the roots can carry the virus as well. And if you put new plants right next to it, and the other roots decompose, potentially you could infect uh, the new tomato plants and change your gloves frequently. We developed a poster for break rooms. It's both English and Spanish that shows symptoms on of tobacco mosaic virus on tomatoes, peppers, as well as petunias, how it can be transmitted and how you can avoid transmission and petunias too oh yeah there's quite a few plants anything that's in the solanaceous family can get it are you hearing and you can download that poster from the utah plant pest website it's a pdf file and you can just download it for free and, and print a copy if you want to alfalfa mosaic virus we only occasionally see that one on tomatoes. It's more common on peppers. It's transmitted by aphids. 
The symptoms you see are calico pattern on leaves of tomatoes and peppers. You get a yellow mosaic on potatoes. And the management options are to avoid planting tomatoes, potatoes, or peppers near alfalfa. Then as soon as the hay gets cut, these aphids have to find a new spot to feed on and they find the potatoes, peppers, and tomatoes next door. And they move there and then they transmit the virus. So you see here the calico pattern on a tomato plant. And then the fruit of the tomatoes, you see these brown necrotic spots on the fruit. Now move from viral diseases to bacterial diseases. Bacterial spot of tomato is caused by several species of Xanthomonas. The bacteria can be seed borne. They can survive in plant debris. So we've only seen that disease a couple of times in Utah. It usually likes it wet, so we see it in the summer where we get like thunderstorms and heavy rain in August when the tomatoes get ripe. You want to use certified seed if you grow your own transplants or you want to get transplants that are um, certified disease free. Initially, the seedlings may not show symptoms. However, they can. So the leaves could turn yellow and fall off. And if you had somebody take care of the plants, they might just you might just think that this person didn't take care properly of the plants and that's why they lost all their leaves. But it could turn out that they actually had bacterial spot and they did recover. And then you planted them and then you had a thunderstorm come through and it started causing the symptoms. The symptoms will show up. It spreads from plant to plant by splashing water by wind or by humans. So if you walk through the your plants and they are wet, you might have the bacteria on your clothes and then you brush by the next plant and you would deposit the bacteria. Or if you use tools and you cut the branches or vines, you could spread it that way too. Infected seedlings, like I said, may not show symptoms initially, but sometimes the leaves can turn yellow and fall off. Older plants show brown necrotic spots on the leaves and fruits with a yellow halo. And eventually the leaves will die. And with tomatoes, the dead leaves remain on the plants. With peppers, they fall off. So here you can see these necrotic spots. And as I mentioned with tomato spotty world virus, these spots look very similar to tomato spotted world virus. So unless you do some testing, you won't know. Unless you see the fruit. So this is very characteristic of bacterial spot. You get these black spots with the yellow halo. Sometimes you also see it on the green fruit. To manage bacterial spot, as I mentioned, you certify disease-free seed or transplants. Remove tomato and pepper plant debris from the field. Rotate with crops for one to two years. Application of copper products when you first see the spots can work, but several states have reported problems with bacteria being resistant to copper, so it would depend where the strain in your crop comes from. Resistant varieties, there are resistant pepper varieties, but there's no resistant tomato varieties. Bacterial canker, we see sometimes in tomatoes, it has never been a major problem in Utah. It's only economically important on tomatoes. Primary infections, you get wilting of the plants. Leaves are infected through bacterial invasion of the hydatodes. Those are openings at the end of the plant hairs. They may develop yellow martens known as firing. And then secondary infections are the spots on leaves and the fruit. And on fruit, the spots are white with a dark center. They're very characteristic. If you see those spots, you know you have bacterial canker. Fruit infection occurs either through the flower infections or invasion, invasion through trichomes in the young fruit. So here you can see the leaf symptoms. So this is what's called firing. 
the reddish brown discoloration. You can see the discoloration inside the stem. And then this is what it looks like on the fruit. The white spots with the black center. The bacteria are seed borne are transmitted through contaminated tools like pruning tools or trays, handling of infected plants and splashing water. And the bacteria survive for up to two years in plant debris. So that's why it's important to do crop rotation for one to two years. And it also can survive on weeds and volunteer tomatoes. Use the seeds free seed, clean trays, pots, benches. And you'll notice that this is kind of a common theme. Using disease free seed, clean trays, pots, benches is going to be your best friend. Disinfect pruning tools with a 70% ethanol solution or disinfecting wipes. Avoid overwatering, irrigate in the morning so the leaves and fruit have time to dry off. Crop rotation for three to four years. I think two years is probably good, but if you can do it for longer, even better. Remove solanaceous weeds as they can be a host. Deep plow plant debris. And copper-based products are effective in greenhouse transplant production, but have been shown to be ineffective in the field after transplanting by other researchers. Liberibacter is uh, another bacterium that we've seen for the first time in 2013 in Utah. It's most important on potatoes, but it can also infect tomatoes and peppers. We found it here and there across the state. The bacterium is non-culturable, so we can't grow it on an artificial medium to identify it. It's called Candidatus Liberibacter solanaceum, and it's transmitted by potato solids. So down here you can see, let's see, the eggs. They are on little stems at the margin of the leaf and you need a dissecting microscope to see them. They're very small. These are the, the nymphs. And then here you have the adults. The adults are about the same size as an aphid. They are, when they fly, they look like a black winged aphid. If you can catch one, or if you have them on a sticky card, they're identifiable. They have this big white stripe across their back. So if you have a hand lens, you can see that without any problems. The symptoms on tomato, you get these yellow chlorotic looking leaves and it looks very similar to a nutrient deficiency. So initially, you might think it's a nutrient deficiency, but it, it won't go away. And most of the time, you also don't get any fruit production. The leaves can also be distorted. Sometimes they're very small. The management is difficult. You can scout for potato solids. You would have to control the potato solids with imidacloprid starting early in the season. Good weed management to reduce the solids can help, but once a plant is infected, there's no cure for it. So the best thing you can do is to remove it so the solids cannot pick up more bacteria and move them to new plants. Now we move on to the fungal diseases, verticillium wilt. Initially, you see the leaves that start to wilt. And the wilting may only occur on one side of the plant, depending which part of the vascular system the fungus has colonized. The leaves may turn brown at the tips. That depends on the plant species. And the vascular tissue in affected stems is discolored. So if you cut a, a main stem and you look, you see that the vascular tissue, instead of being white, is actually brown. And most vegetables, with the exception of asparagus, beans, peas, carrots, and sweet potatoes, are susceptible to verticillium wilt. Here you can see the initial foliar symptoms. And then here you can see the vascular discoloration. And you can easily see that. You don't need a hand lens or anything. Verticillium is spread by 
uh, spores that are produced on the plants and also microsclerotia that are residing in the soil. So microsclerotia are these black hard balls of mycelium. They're just a couple of millimeters in size. And they can survive in the so soil for many years. And it can just sit there and wait for a suitable host to come along that it can then colonize. And from what I've read in the literature, it can survive for up to 20 years in the soil. For management of verticillium, use raised beds with either plastic mulch cover covering the ground or raising the beds up above ground if you have a problem in your um, garden or on your farm. Use resistant varieties when they're available. Usually for um, most seed companies will have a V listed with disease resistance and that stands for verticillium. And with the raised beds, you want to make sure that the roots do not come in contact with the ground that would carry the verticillium. Fusarium wilt is another fungal disease that we occasionally see. So Fusarium oxysporum forms forma specialis. They're very host specific. They will all look the same, but the one that goes to tomato will only go to tomato. It won't go to peppers or melons or anything else. Likewise, the one that goes to melons will not go to tomatoes. The symptoms are very similar to verticillium. You can see plants wilting during the hot part of the day, and then they may recover initially when the temperatures cool down. And you will also see the vascular discoloration. And here are some plants that are infected with verticillium wilt. You see some chlorosis and wilting. Then here you see again that vascular discoloration. But unless you grow the fungus out on an artificial medium, you could not say for sure if it's fusarium or verticillium. And the dispersal for fusarium, the spores are produced on infected plant material. And there's also resting spores that can survive in the in the soil, and you can see some of these resting spores here. And as with verticillium, use raised beds with either plastic mulch covering the ground or raising the beds up above ground. And there are resistant varieties available. And they will either have just an F listed or an or a FOX, F-O-X, for Fusarium oxysporum in the disease resistance. Tomato big bud, we see occasionally it's not a very important disease in Utah. It's a phytoplasma that's transmitted also by the beet leafhopper, the same insect that transmits curly top. A phytoplasma is basically a bacterium that doesn't have a cell wall. So it always has to be inside a host, either the beet leafhopper or the tomato plant. The symptoms you see are large swollen green flower buds. They are very obvious. They're a lot bigger than normal flower buds. The swollen buds will not set fruit. You also get thick stems and distorted leaves. So here you can see these thick flower buds the distorted leaves, thickened stems. And then we have tomato fruit pox. We have, I've only seen it once in Utah. It can affect any tomato variety. The symptoms occur when fast growing plants and fruit are exposed to high temperatures. And often the side that's exposed to the sun is the one that's most affected. And you just get these little spots on the, on the fruit. It doesn't affect the interior part for the fruit, as far as I could tell from the samples that I had. But it just looks very unsightly. 
russet mites on tomatoes, they're area fruit mites, so they don't look anything like a spider mite. They're very small. They look more like little worms with four front legs. You need a very strong hand lens to see them or a dissecting microscope. They're cream to pale orange colored, and you can see them here in masses on plant. There are other hosts like potatoes and peppers, but usually they're not a problem on those hosts. They're only a problem on tomatoes. The symptoms you see, and that's why I usually get the samples, is that you get bronze discoloration of leaves and stems, the russeting, that's where they get their name from. In severe infestations, stems will lose their hairs. And fruit russeting and cracking of fruit, uneven ripening, and the plants will die from severe infections. So here you can see a picture of leaves and stems that are affected. And then here we have some fruit that was se severely affected by the russet mites. And down here you have the uneven ripening of the fruit. Management for russet mites, applications of sulfur or abamectin helps remove alternate weed hosts like nightshades or morning glory to reduce the amount of potential russet mites in your field and just keep an eye on your plants. Don't wait until half the plants look completely wilted or dried up before you try and figure out what was going on. Then again, here's that poster that you can download and that's all that I have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Claudia. So as you guys can see, there's like a lot of tomato diseases out there. And kind of what Claudia was saying, they all fall into either a viral disease, fungal, or bacterial. So when you guys are out in your garden, you want to look for those different signs or symptoms on your plants. And if you guys like have any questions, you could feel free to email me. You could email Claudia. We also have Becky and Ginger at our horticulture help desk down in Salt Lake. And I think we have Meredith down in Utah County. So I kind of want to talk to you guys just a bit kind of more about the curly top virus. So Claudia is doing a lot of work with that. And then we're actually doing a trial at four different sites across Utah. We're doing one in North Logan, Kaysville, Sandy, and Mapleton, where we're looking at the effectiveness of row covers. So here's this beet leaf hopper that we were talking about earlier. It's super specific. And like Claudia said, you need a microscope to really identify it. So I've been kind of honing my skills on that. So you can see kind of in this middle picture, we have that not super sharp nose, but kind of the rounded and it's got the two little black speckles on its face. And it has a variety of hosts. And like Claudia said, it doesn't like tomato plants. It'll bite into it and then it'll move on to the next plant, unfortunately spreading that disease. And if you guys look, I have a list of various weed hosts that can attract the beet leaf hopper. And so what we did is we put the row covers on the transplants because early summer is when those leaf hoppers are active, especially those first to six, eight weeks of planting. And both the adults and nymph stage are the ones that cause that problem. And we believe they overwinter on volunteer plants, kind of in the more warmer areas during kind of the cooler season. So like Southern Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and they can migrate north on different spring wind currents. And they can have several generations per year. And here's some more pictures of that curly top virus of what happens. And like Claudia said, there's different strains of it ranging from kind of mild to severe. And various plants can show kind of similar symptoms, some more severe and some more mild. So Claudia and I are both noticing a lot of tomatoes throughout Utah that are showing and testing positive for symptoms of the virus. So especially if you're a large grower and you have several different plants, it might be a little bit easier to tell. So this is a picture I took this afternoon. This is in Claudia's trial in Kaysville. 
So she has several rows of tomatoes. And then in the picture, I have the three circles. Those are the ones you can kind of tell are infected with the curly top virus. You can tell they're a lot smaller um, compared to the other tomato plants. And they kind of are just stunted growth. They don't have that bright green color. And if you look closer, kind of like on this other picture, they have that purpling of the veins. And I know that purpling of the veins on a lot of plants, that could be a symptom of phosphorus deficiency, which usually isn't a huge problem in Utah, especially growers who regularly fertilize. So you don't want to confuse it with that. So you want to look for those curling of the newer leaves as well. So here's kind of a graphic of the trial that we're doing. Um, at four different sites, we have 80 tomato plants. Two of the rows are covered with the Agrabond 15 row cover. We just use kind of a simple hoop system. And then two of the rows are exposed. And we're using yellow sticky traps to monitor for those beet leaf hoppers. And they're super tiny. So what I do is I just take the traps and then I'll take them back to my office and then I'll look for those tiny little beet leaf hoppers. And then I'll work with Claudia to determine if they are in fact the beet leaf hopper and not just some other species. And what we're noticing so far with our data from last year and so far this season, that the rows that aren't covered have a lot more leaf hoppers compared to the ones that are covered. So with this trial, we're hoping to get some plants that are infected with the curly top virus, just to kind of run the numbers and see exactly how effective row covers are and how practical that would be for a commercial grower to implement on their site. Okay, so next, Claudia and I, we asked some of you guys to submit questions of your tomato plants. And Claudia, is your microphone still on? Yeah, should be. Okay. I didn't turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this was our first photo. This was submitted by a grower in Etna, Wyoming. And she was doing, it looks like some hydroponics. And she sent this back in, a couple, she said this photo was from a couple weeks ago. And she was wondering what was up with the curling of the leaves. Well, it could be a lot of things. There could be some root rot, potentially, especially if these plants are wilting. So it mm -hmm. might be worthwhile taking a look at the roots to see if they're still white and healthy looking or if they're kind of brown and discolored. Could be a nutrient imbalance. Sometimes with those nutrient solutions that can happen. But based on the picture, there's not much more I can I can yeah, like it looks like a that. really cool elaborate system that she has built, like a super DIY system. Do you think a lot of hydroponic growers? I don't. We don't have very much of that in Utah. I know there's a place down in Heber City area, but for the most part, do you think a lot of hydroponic growers in general would experience root rot problems? Um, I've seen some that do once they get Pythium or some of the other soil-borne fungi that also like it wet in their yeah. system because there's nutrients in your sol in the solution and they get you know spread around so once that that comes in then yeah you, you can see a root rot and i wonder if it would be a good idea for sandy to like after the harvest of the season to like deep clean that whole greenhouse space yes yes scrub those buckets with bleach yeah and also the, <laughs> the pipes, if they can be disinfected, that would be good too. Yeah. But also making sure after the disinfection that you rinse them really well with water because you don't want to have any chlorine or any other disinfectant left. Sometimes you could get phytotoxicity. Yeah. So our next question is from Elizabeth. And she's... This is one of her tomato plants, and it looks like a lot of foliage is starting to curl. And I know a lot of our growers everywhere are seeing this, especially the past few weeks where their tomato leaves are curling, and that's causing a lot of concern. It's not curly top. It's usually, I see that if you have very high temperatures, and sometimes the plants are dry, the plants are 
I think closing up their leaves to avoid transpiring too much water. They're trying to conserve water. Exactly. So if you're out in your garden, especially if it's been really hot and you're noticing this, it's probably not disease related. Again, it's just environmental and temperature related. So our next question is from Eleanor in North Ogden. And she had a couple pictures of her tomato fruits and then the foliage itself. There is a small possibility it could be a bacterial spot disease. It could also be just a nutrient deficiency. Hard to say without actually looking at the leaves under the microscope or trying to culture any fungal yeah. or bacterial pathogens. Yeah, and I know I learned this in school, but I think it would be good for like everyone to kind of become familiar with the different common micro and macro nutrients that plants need and what the different deficiencies look like. Because I know nitrogen deficiencies usually represented by the older leaves turning yellow because the plant is pulling those nutrients from the older leaves to supply it. So that's an indicator that your soil is low in nitrogen. And I talked about earlier phosphorus deficiency is usually represented by the purple veining on the back sides of the leaves. So I think I released a pest advisory recently about kind of understanding the difference between weather related problems and nutrient deficiency related problems compared to actual disease. So I think as growers, it's good to familiar familiarize ourselves with that. So this next one is from Justin in West Valley City. The leaves are becoming super kind of crinkled. 2,4-D damage. Yeah. Either from drift or maybe residue in a sprayer that was used for something else or yeah. compost or manure that has been applied. Because if yeah, you have so like like horse manure or cow manure and animals have been feeding on a pasture that had been treated with herbicide <laughs> yeah. go right through their stomach. And if you put that in your garden, that manure, you will see herbicide damage. That's fast. And so if you're, our growers who aren't familiar with that, so like 2,4-D is like a common industrial grade herbicide and you can correct me, Claudia, but when it's super hot out, I'm not sure the exact threshold of the temperature, but that spray volatilizes, especially if the landscape or farmer, when they're out spraying in like the middle, middle of the afternoon, it volatilizes in kind of like this gas cloud, and it can move quite a bit of a distance. And unfortunately, that could even hit your garden. And that's kind of what causes the really extreme cupping of the leaves. And we can see similar symptoms on all types of like broadleaf plants. Okay, so this is our last one. This is from Derek in Salt Lake City. Possible that this is hail damage, but it's hard to tell from the picture. Yeah, if you guys are part of our Utah Gardening Experts Facebook group, we were getting tons of photos like this where tomato leaves are getting those like tiny little brown spots. And if you live along the Wasatch Front or other parts of northern Utah, you know, we got hail, I think it was about a couple weekends ago. And that was really hard on a lot of our vegetable crops, especially like tomatoes and cucurbit crops that have those kind of big leaves. So when the hail strikes that, it can kind of rip through the leaves or kind of cause these little brown indentations. But I think the good news is tomatoes can be pretty strong. So if they're, if your tomato plants are having a lot of new growth on the newer or the higher parts of the plant, that's a good indicator that the plants will usually bounce back.